I will sing you the praises of the way to the beyond, said Pingya, when he returned to where the Brahmin Bhavari lives on the banks of the river Godavari. It was described to us by this man exactly as he saw it. But then there isn't any reason why a man like him should lie. A mammoth of knowledge, and completely pure, a man without desire. When a voice has none of the glibness of pride, and none of the ingrained stains of ignorance, then its words are full of sweetness and beauty. It is such words that I praise now. They call him Buddha, enlightened, awake. Dissolving darkness with total vision, and knowing the world to its ends, he has gone beyond all the states of being and of becoming. He has no inner poison drives. He is the total elimination of suffering. This man, Brahmin Barbary, is the man I follow. So, yeah, that's a very famous um, se series of verses from a, a very ancient Buddhist text called the Sutta Nipata. And um, yeah, it tells a story of an encounter between two men, a man called Pingya and his old teacher, his previous teacher, a man called Bhavari, <laughs> Brahmin Bhavari. And they're very uh, famous verses and very beautiful verses as well because it's a really um, heartfelt expression of positive emotion, of reverence and devotion to the Buddha from Pingya. So we're going to be, um, I'm going to be exploring this encounter, telling the story of this encounter uh, during this evening's talk, that's going to be the theme of tonight's talk, this encounter between Pingya and Bhavari. But before I do that, I'm going to recap on the theme for people who, who may not know what the theme is, but we've been doing it for a while, so you should do. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I don't know what it means to be, <laughs> just like you ought to, you know. Um, so the theme we're looking at is the five aspects of the spiritual path, or five aspects of the Dharma life or the system of practice. There's lots of different names for this, but it's a very important list. And what we've been looking at, um, well, we've got, we are going to look through stories, we're going to explore all five of these aspects over the coming weeks. We've spent a lot of time on integration, how we um, harness all the different parts of ourselves, how we harness all that energy, bring awareness to the different parts of ourselves, the heights and the depths. And then we've spent a few weeks now looking at positive emotion, the second aspect where um, yeah, all that energy that's harnessed, we have to redirect it. We have to, we have to kind of direct it into a positive flow, a skillful direction. So we're retraining our mind, our, our emotions, we're cultivating positive emotions. So we've looked at friendship, gratitude. Um, yeah, and we've looked at a series of emotions called the Brahma Viharas, um, which Mokshatara mentioned last week, I was here for last week's talk, and she also looked at gratitude. Hopefully you can see these four. Another series of, a very important series of positive emotions. And they're called Brahma Viharas, and that, that translates as heavenly abodes. They're sometimes called the unlimitables, or they, um, they're described as being unlimited, unlimited positive emotions. But they're, they're, yeah, it's said that if you, if you dwell in these states, then it's like dwelling in heaven right near and here and now. So that's why they're called heavenly abodes. So, um, the, the kind of foundation, the root positive emotion is metta, loving kindness, which we, you know, we're all familiar with. But then metta meets, it encounters different things in our experience. So if metta, our, our loving kindness, our desire for another person's well-being, meets suffering, if that person is suffering, well metta becomes compassion, it just naturally becomes compassion in response to that suffering. Then likewise, if our desire for someone's well-being encounters somebody's well-being, well then we naturally feel joy for that person, what we call sympathetic joy, mudita. We just feel really happy, delighted for that person. And then when metta just has a, a kind of perspective on the whole of experience and encounters both the ups and downs of, of life, then there's equanimity. It's a, it's a metta that knows there's going to be ups and downs. There's a, what we call upeksha, equanimity. So there's a four, four Brahma Viharas, I'm going to re revisit that list later. Um, but this evening we're going to be focusing on a really important positive emotion, which is uh, a bit unfashionable in our society, it's reverence. I'm going to be talking about reverence this evening, which I haven't written up, but it's an English word, reverence. Um, and yeah, I was, I was reading 
uh, about what Sangha Akshita has to say about reverence and, and our culture. And it's quite interesting. What he had to say was that in the West, when he, when, when he was first starting to give talks, what he noticed in the West was that we've got a very strong intellect compared to some other cultures. We're very strong on intellect, on studying, on reading, on concepts. And, and that's even you know, stronger now. We've got the internet. We've got so many books, so many ideas, so many concepts that are available to us. But he said that, you know, understanding these, these books and these concepts and these words, we don't understand Buddhism. It's not, we don't understand Buddhism at all, which I found really interesting. He said, we literally don't understand it at all. It's not, it isn't about the, the, the concepts and the words. It's, I mean, he puts that quite strongly, and you could, you, know, you could put other arguments as well, that concepts are really, really important. But at the same time, you can see how our society really skews towards the intellect. And he talks about how we have a sense of when we understand something, we've mastered it, we, we've mastered that topic. And there can be a sense of su superiority towards that, to that subject, we've mastered it. So, you know, if we bring that attitude to the Dharma, to Buddhism, we can have a sense of mastering the concepts of Buddhism. You know, we can feel almost superior towards the concepts of Buddhism. And that's a dangerous place to be in, actually. That's a really dangerous place to be in because um, th we use concepts in Buddhism to go beyond the concepts. And um, there was a quote that Sangha actually used from uh, a philosopher called Goethe, who we heard about a few weeks ago from Verdanya. But apparently Goethe said, the finest achievement for men of thought is to have fathomed the fathomable and quietly revere that which is unfathomable. I'll say that again. The finest achievement for men of thought is to have fathomed the fathomable and quietly revere that which is unfathomable. So I think yeah, in our culture we have a real desire to understand and master things, but we, you know, with, with the Dharma we can't. It's, it's ultimately unfathomable. It's not something we can conceptually grasp or understand. But we can have, we can read, maybe we read lots of books and we can think, okay, well, it's almost like we can have a, it's almost like a, you know, we can, we can almost maybe perhaps look down on other cultures, the more traditional Buddhist cultures who practice reverence, who practice devotion, who are offering flowers to shrines and paying respects to shrines. So like we're more superior, we're more intellectual than that because we, we understand things better. But actually, according to Sangrach, to a theoretical understanding of Buddhism is, is very, very superficial. Um, without the depth of the, the important emotions of reverence and devotion. So and we're focusing on the importance of devotion and reverence this evening, hopefully just explaining why it is so important and, and exploring some of the obstacles, some of the barriers that we can experience in regards to reverence. Uh, but first, just a, uh, a little <coughs> anecdote that I was reminded of in our team meeting. So um, I wasn't planning to tell it, but I think it's good, so I'll tell it. And it was, um, yeah, but Daniel talked about how in the team meeting we can experience reverence in particular places. We go into particular places and we can experience reverence. And I had a, an experience of this, I think it was last year or the year before, about 18 months ago. And we went, we went on a holiday, Lucy and I and Robert, we went on a holiday to Barcelona. And we were just walking around Barcelona one day and it's a pretty, pretty kind of drizzly, kind of miserable day. And Lucy really wanted to see the... The, the famous cathedral, the Sagrada Familia. Um, I've forgotten now the name of the architect. Gaudi, that's it, Gaudi. It's a really kind of um, wacky cathedral, actually. It's just an un unconventional cathedral. And um, I'd seen it before. I'd seen it from the outside. And I'd been inside it. And it was a building site, really, when I went inside. It wasn't that much to see. But Lucy was really... We'd gone and we'd seen the outside. And I just wanted to go to the beach, I think, or just to kind of you know, do something else. And... Um, I was feeling really grumpy about it, and Lucy was, Lucy was just really keen to go inside the cathedral because she'd never been inside the cathedral. Um, so I kind of went just really reluctantly, really, you know, quite a bad mood about it. I just didn't want to do it. I thought it was going to be a waste of time. And um, what happened was I went through, we just walked straight through into the cathedral, and we were just blown away, actually. I was, I was moved to tears, actually, just by the, um, the beauty of it. I walked in, and there was just this amazing light just streaming in through the windows. This whole, if you imagine this, this it's been much bigger than this, this room, but imagine the side of the Great Hall, and the whole side of it is, is just stained glass of different shades of red. And red's a particularly important colour for me. But this whole window is shed different shades of red, red glass. And the sun must have just come out from behind the clouds and just streamed in this just beautiful red light. It just seemed like it was, 
it was heavenly, almost divine. It just and, and I was just really deeply moved by it. It just seemed like a real, a really beautiful place, and a, a, you know, just a very there's a real stillness, a real still atmosphere in the place. So yeah, it really, really just lifted me, really transported me from this grumpy state of mind into this space where I just wanted to meditate. I wanted to kind of um, yeah, just just so amazed, so awestruck by this this beautiful building. So. I think, yeah, that's a theme I'll be re revisiting in the talk is my own kind of cynicism and grumpiness and beauty and reverence and kind of how the relationship between them really, how they affect each other. So, yeah, there's some background there to reverence and why it can be a problem, but I want to now revisit the story of Pingya and Bhavari, the Brahmin and Bhavari, and just explore, see what we can learn from that story. So this is, yeah, from the time of the Buddha, so, you know, to over two and a half thousand years ago. And this, there's this uh, yeah, hermit, this, this Brahmin hermit called Bhavari. And he lives on the banks of a river called the river Godavari. And he basically lives a very simple life. He lives the life of a hermit, a renunciant life, and he begs for his food. And at the time, around the time of this story, um, he was visited by another Brahmin who um, basically asked him as a guest, I think it was a tradition as a guest, you had to feed and look after your, your guest. And Bhavari said, I haven't got any food, I haven't got anything. He made him welcome, he looked after him, he was very nice to him, but said, I'm afraid I haven't got any food, I can't feed you. And this, uh, the second chap who'd come to visit uh, was really angry about, about this, and he cursed Bhavari, and he chanted some ancient rituals and curses and said that by the end of the week, Bhavari's head would be split into pieces by this curse, because he had, he had not honoured the tradition of feeding his guest. So Bhavari was a man of tradition and he was really troubled by this, he was really upset, frightened, you know, he took this very, very seriously, he'd been cursed. And it said that he just, he just couldn't sleep, he couldn't, um, he couldn't meditate, he couldn't think clearly. And it said like sadness and grief were like darts in his side, he was just really um, overcome, overwhelmed by this curse. And according to the story, what happened was uh, a local spirit or goddess took pity on Bhavari. She saw what was happening and paid him a visit. And she told him not to worry. No, don't worry, this, this man was a con man, basically. He wasn't a real Brahmin. And the curse isn't a real curse. And, but Bhavari was just still overwhelmed. He was just really, really troubled by it. And he said, well, do you know about head splitting? Can you tell me about head splitting? And she said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know anything about head splitting. So who does? I must, I must understand head splitting. Tell me, tell me about head splitting. And she said, well, only the enlightened ones understand about heads and head splitting. And he said, okay, well, where is an enlightened one? Where is an enlightened being? She said, well, there is the Buddha. From the Shakyan clan, there is born, the, the, you know, she told him the story of the Buddha. Basically, the Buddha has been born. He's fully awake. And where is he living? Where is he living? He's living, um, right now, he's living in Vaishali, which was quite a bit to the north of where Bhavari was. And apparently just on hearing the name Buddha, he was just lifted into a state of intense joy, just hearing the name <coughs> of the Buddha. And he said, oh, well, you know, I must, I must honour this man, I must pay reverence, I must honour this great man. It was interesting what Bhavari did. Um, he didn't choose to go himself to, to honour and revere the Buddha. He was uh, apparently the leader, he had 500 people following him, 500 disciples. So what he did was he called 16 of his disciples, senior disciples, and said, there's, there's an enlightened being, you must visit him, you must go and pay reverence to him. And it seems sounds like Bhavari is a kind of a, a cynical chap. I can relate to him from my, my own cynicism, but he, he was a bit cynical and a bit sneaky, and he said to his disciples, if the Buddha is as great as he's supposed to be, he'll be able to read your mind, so don't ask him the questions out loud, just think the questions. And asking questions about me, the questions should be about me. And especially head splitting, I want to know about head splitting. <laughs> <laughs> so he sent his 16 disciples off to learn about head splitting and go and see the Buddha. And they traveled for some time, they had to travel and make you know, through, through stages, through villages to different places until they reached Vaishali, and they, which is where the Buddha was staying. And they had to climb up a mountain, went to the top of a mountain where the Buddha was teaching his disciples. And some really great metaphors in this chapter and um, yeah, the goddess early describes the Buddha as being like a bull, having the strength of a bull and here he's described as, as the lion roaring in the jungle and he's, he's teaching the Dharma to his disciples it said it's like he was a lion roaring, roaring in the jungle 
So anyway, the, the disciples come and join the crowd, and um, in one of the, it said that one of the disciples recognises that the Buddha is enlightened because he's just, he's just giving off this kind of, he just perceives this light, he's giving off this light, it's like he's shining like the sun or like a, a moon on a full moon night, he's just beaming with this light. So there's a disciple called Ajita who recognises this must be the Buddha. So he, he, okay, well, I'll think the question. He starts to think his questions about his master. And then the Buddha answers out loud. The Buddha answers out loud the questions. He starts to tell him about his teacher. He asks questions about his teacher, and the Buddha just tells him information about his teacher, who his teacher is, what his attainments are, some of his physical features, which um, about, seem to be important. And, um, yeah, basically the crowd's thinking, well, what's the Buddha doing? Who's he talking to? He's just kind of talking out loud. Is he talking to a deity or a god who's he talking to and then um ajata is com- you know is, is convinced by the ant- answers and then he says i would need to ask you about head splitting as well um mm. you know, can you tell me about head splitting and the buddha obviously i think he must have realized that head splitting was a load of nonsense but he um that's actually that's i talk about my cynical voice that says things are a load of nonsense later but um yeah, so the Buddha realizes actually, obviously this isn't helpful, but he thinks, okay, well, I can use this as a metaphor. So what he says is, okay, well, the head is ignorance. It's like he uses a metaphor, the head is ignorance, and it is shattered into pieces, it's split into pieces by wisdom and the, its army of powers faith, mindfulness. Oh, I lost it. Okay, I can't remember the list. Where is it? Faith, mindfulness, meditation, and energy. And that's a, a list, if people are interested in this, that's a list of uh, the five spiritual faculties. Uh, wisdom, I've lost again, wisdom, faith, mindfulness, meditation, and energy. So the Buddha turns this obsession with head splitting into a kind of, he starts to direct the conversation towards what really matters, wisdom and understanding. And, um, and then basically there follows the whole rest of the chapter is a series of questions. The Buddha invites the other disciples to ask him questions. He says, well, basically your, your community has got a lot of doubt and confusion. It's an opportunity to ask me questions. So the whole series of kind of quick fire questions and um, some really direct pithy answers from the Buddha, just a- answering each of the disciples of Barbara, just answering them di- very, very directly. And there's some very good yeah, metaphors and um, dharma in there. There's one I really liked where um, one disciple says to the Buddha, Basically, he says to the Buddha, can you free me from confusion? Can you save me? Can you free me from, from, from confusion? And the Buddha says, no, it's not my practice to save people from confusion. You need to save yourself. Um, you, know, you, need to, you need to practice yourself. And so there's some really kind of very strong, pithy, just direct teachings. And um, you know, what follows is by the end of the exchanges, they're no longer disciples of Bar- Barbary. They're now disciples of the Buddha. They become followers and disciples of the Buddha. They're really convinced by him. And there's something very, I find very exciting about this chapter. There's something really kind of potent in the Buddha's teaching of these people. These are considered to be amongst the earliest uh, recorded teachings of the Buddha. They're not kind of, often you get suttas where it's broken down into kind of repetition for chanting. But this is just quite direct and quite pithy. It's almost like how the Buddha might have responded to these people quite directly. So I find this chapter very exciting. So they become, they all become disciples of the Buddha these 16 guys. Um, but there's one particular disciple who's an elderly guy called Pingir. He's quite old and frail. And, um, yeah, he, he basically, because of he, he's old and frail, he can't follow the Buddha around. He has to, he returns, he decides to return back to, to Bhavari just to, just to share, yeah, share what they've discovered. The rest of the disciples presumably stay with the Buddha, but Bhavari returns. And that's where you get this encounter that I referred to right at the start of the talk. So, um, Pingi has returned back to the river Godavari, he's, he's on the banks, and he meets Barbary, his old teacher. And, and um, he sa- basically says to Barbary, I will sing you the praises of the way to the beyond. And this is um, how the Buddha describes the Dharmic path. The Buddha describes the path as being the way, the way beyond suffering, the way to the beyond. So Barbary just, uh, Pingi says to Barbary, I will sing you the praises of the way to the beyond. And it's just a really heartfelt response of rejoicing. We talk about um, metta and gratitude and rejoicing in merits on our, you know, here in our classes and our courses. And this is a really spontaneous example of, of, of Pingir just reeling off kind of just a load of um, 
yeah, just just praise towards the Buddha, reverence, devotion to the Buddha. So I just want to kind of explore what, what Pingya says to Bhavari and basically what we can learn about Pingya and about reverence and about yeah, what this can mean to us, how, we, how can it affect our practice. So we've got this list of the Brahma Viharas and yeah, I, was, I referred to it as what happens when metta meets different, different parts of experience. So metta can meet somebody's joy and it becomes mudita. It can meet somebody's suffering and becomes compassion. But what happens when metta encounters you know, somebody higher than us, some, somebody further along the path than us, something more beautiful, something higher than us? What happens is metta becomes rever- reverence and it becomes something called shraddha, a Buddhist word called shraddha. And I liked what Mokshita did last week. She highlighted a word like this. I think that works very well for me. So I've done that with Shraddha. Shraddha. And um, Shraddha is a, it's a word that's difficult to translate because I don't, we don't have a direct equivalent in English. So it's usually translated as faith. And the English equivalent of faith is very different to Shraddha. So it can give quite a, a you know, kind of skewed meaning of what Shraddha is. Sometimes it's translated as confidence, uh, trust. It could also be translated as wholeheartedness, maybe. Um, but if you put all those things together, kind of faith, confidence, trust, wholeheartedness, it gives you a sense of what Shraddha means. But it's basically when, when your loving kindness, your metta, encounters something higher than you, it becomes, it becomes reverence and it becomes Shraddha. And that's what's happening in, the, in this situation. So for me, Shraddha could could be considered almost like a fifth Brahma Vihara, it's like a kind of an additional Brahma Vihara because it's, you know, in the same way it meets, yeah, it's when metta meets something higher. So it's translated as faith, but it certainly isn't blind faith. So when we think of faith, we often um, alarm bells can go off because we have experiences of being told what to believe really and not being able to prove it and it not really making sense, but we're just told to believe it. So we have this term of blind faith. And Shraddha certainly isn't that. So Sangharachita describes Shraddha in, in lots of different ways. One way he describes it is as though, as though there's a thread in us which is all the time connected to what's highest in us and what's highest in the universe. And sometimes we're completely unaware of it and sometimes we're more aware of it. And it can be cultivated and it can be strengthened. So in some people it's a very, very strong thread. In other people it's just very, very, threat, very, very weak. But it's there in all of us. There's a connection with what's all the time to what's highest in us and what's highest in other people. So that's one way of describing Shraddha. And he's also described it as, as what's highest in us uh, resonating with what's highest in the universe. And um, yeah, and he, another definition of Shraddha that he's given is that it's, our, it's a spiritual intuition, but it's not a kind of blind faith. It's a spiritual intuition where we know something is true or we know, you know, we know the Dharma is true, or we know this is very, very important. But it's also based on our experience, we can test it out. The Buddha encouraged his followers just to test out all of his teachings for themselves, not to take anything just because he said it, but to test it out on their experience. So anything you hear here at the Buddhist Centre, you must always test it out to see if it's true in your own experience. Don't just believe it because Bodhinaga is saying it, or Vedanya or Satyajyoti is saying it. You must test it out in your own experience. And also... Um, Shraddha is grounded in reason, so you can test out the Dharma and you can see if it makes sense intellectually, you can see if it makes sense logically. So you've got all these different ways of connecting with your heart and your guts and with your intellect. So Shraddha is a kind of whole person response to what's highest, it involves all these different elements. Yeah, so Pingya meets Bhavari and he just kind of, it's just this pours out of him, this kind of response pours out of him, he just sings the praises of the Buddha. But you can, you can see from what he's saying that it isn't, it isn't blind faith because he's really observed the Buddha, he's observed his teaching and he's observed the kind of man that the Buddha is. So he says, it, it was described to us as he saw it. But then there's no reason for him to lie, a man like him to lie. A mammoth of knowledge. Which again, there's all these different kind of animal um, similes for the Buddha and I really like a mammoth. I kind of uh, think of a woolly mammoth for some reason. I don't know if there's other types of mammoths but just the Buddha is this kind of... <laughs> mammoth of knowledge, completely pure, without desire. When someone speaks without pride or ignorance, their words are full of sweetness and beauty. 
And this could also be a little bit of a dig towards um, Barbary, his old teacher, who probably didn't speak without ignorance or pride. So he's saying, well, actually, the Buddha's words were full of sweetness and beauty. There was no, no pride there, no ignorance there. They call him Buddha, awake. He has total vision. He dissolves darkness. He knows the world to its ends. So this, this, um, yeah, this description of the Buddha reminded me of a William Blake quote, where William Blake, I wasn't able to find the reference of the poem, but he says in one of his poems that it's possible to see the universe in a flower. I think that's right. See the universe in a flower, is that right? A grain of sand. In a grain of sand. What is it about a flower then? <laughs> is it not said anything about a flower? <laughs> Eternity in an hour? Eternity in the sun. Something rhymes with flower. Flower rhymes with hour. So I'm pretty sure there's a flower in there. Okay, it's a grain of sand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's pretend there's a flower in there. And a grain of sand. So you can basically, it's the same, it's, it holds true for either a flower or a grain of sand. <laughs> you can, basically, if you can see if you can see the universe in one thing, well then, if you can see reality and the truth in one part of your experience, well then you can see the whole of reality because it's it's got it's all has the same flavour. It's the same. So if you can see reality in a flower or in a grain of sand, then you can see reality. Well, you know you know the world to its ends. So I think that that, that reminds me of that quote when uh, Pingya says the Buddha knows the world to its ends. He knows. Reality he knows the flavour of reality. He knows, he knows the whole of experience. And he says he is the total elimination of suffering. This man, Brahmin, Brahmin Bhavari, is a man I follow. So he, Bhavari won't like that, I don't think, because he's no longer a disciple of Bhavari. He's now a disciple of Pingya. And then he goes on. Pingya then goes on to compare his new teacher to previous teachers, which again Bhavari might not like very much. It says, before, there was only the bleary half-light of opinions. You get, the sense, you, know, we, we, get, you get the sense of what it might have been like in traditional India. Lots and lots of people with lots and lots of opinions of um, what, what the truth was. And Pingya experiences have been like a bleary, dull half-light, where the Buddha was like a beam of light that dissolved darkness, where this was just kind of a, opinions and speculation, just like a bleary half-light. So he said, I'm, I'm like a bird that has left the scrubland and has found the fruit trees of the forest. So he's now found something that's really beautiful and nourishing compared to the, the scrubland of his previous teaching. I'm like a swan that has reached a great lake. So yeah, I was thinking about this image, and it, okay, well, a, a swan, when it reaches a great lake, that's where it should be. A swan's a very beautiful, graceful being. It shouldn't be in a kind of you know, dirty pond. It should be in a great lake. So it's, you know, Pingi has found where he should be. He's like a swan that's reached a great lake. And he says, before there was only tradition, that was how it was, this is how it was, and this is how it will always be, the breeding ground for speculation. So he's really, um, you could say, it might come across as being quite critical of, of um, his, his, previous, his previous tradition. And then he, he compares, he praises the Buddha and says, yeah, the Buddha's like a, ble a beam of light that dissolves the darkness. The Buddha is a universe of wisdom, a world of understanding. So I think this is a really... Again, another interesting description of the Buddha, a universe of wisdom. The Buddha is being a universe or a world of, a world of understanding. So it's not, it's, it's not seeing the Buddha as a, a person, but as a, a world or a universe that he can, he can enter into. He can, he can become part of this universe, this world. So I'll come back to that later, but um, I think that's very interesting. And then he says, his Dharma, his teaching is the way things are. Instant, immediate, Visible all around, eroding desire without harmful side effects. There is nothing quite like it anywhere in the world. So it's basically just this pouring out of Pingya, just this praise of the Buddha, praise of his teaching, and uh, yeah, just a real gratitude, a real kind of joyful response to his new teacher. But Bhavari, yeah, you can imagine Bhavari is pretty cheesed off by now. He's kind of encountered. Pingi, and Pingi has told him how great the Buddha is, how much better he is than his previous teacher. So Bhavari says to, to Pingi, well, if the Buddha is so special, if he's you know, a universe of wisdom, if he's so great, if he's a, a beam of light, why aren't you with him now? Why aren't you following him now? Why aren't you with him? And uh, Pingi's answer is quite unexpected, I think, probably for Bhavari. What Pingi says is, Brahmin, sir, there isn't a moment for me, however small, that is spent away from the Buddha. So 
That sounds quite a strange thing to say. There isn't a moment for me, however small, that is spent away from the Buddha. So Pingi, Pingi explains to Bhavari that he practices and cultivates a, a constant awareness and reverence of the Buddha. So he says, you see, sir, with constant and careful vigilance, it's possible for me to see the Buddha as clearly with my mind as with my eyes, in night as well as day. And as I spend my nights revering the Buddha, there's not a single moment spent away from him. So, yeah, that's quite a thing to say. So he, he's, he can see, he, yeah, through a constant vigilance, constant and careful vigilance, he can see the Buddha with his mind as clearly as with his eyes, and there's not a moment that he spends apart from the Buddha. So, yeah, I think he, he says that to Bhavi, I can't, I just can't, I can't move, I actually can't move away from his teaching, he says. I, I, I can't be separated from the Buddha's teaching. Whichever direction this universe of wisdom goes, it draws me with it. So again, he talks about the, the Buddha as being a universe of wisdom, a world of understanding, and that basically he's, he's constantly in this kind of sphere, this kind of world of the Buddha being influenced by it. So I think straight away you get, we get a couple of... Um, clues as to why reverence is very important, what the benefits of reverence can be. Firstly, you get the comparison of Pingir and Bhavari. Ping, you know, Bhavari is kind of a cynical man who kind of didn't want to go and meet the Buddha himself. He was, yeah, he didn't think the Buddha was important enough for him to go and visit himself. He's quite a, a kind of cynical, almost kind of um, conceited man. And then you've got Pingir who basically... Um, yeah, just full of devotion and reverence and gratitude and joy. And they're quite, you can see quite yeah, starkly different people. And so, the, you know, the benefit of, of Pingi's kind of open heart to the Buddha, his, his reverence to the Buddha, is that he has really kind of undermined his, his, what you might call ego, his kind of sense of importance, the sense that he's the centre of the universe, he's something special. And from a Buddhist perspective, this is, this is crucial. This is one of the things that causes us most of our suffering, this sense of, our own importance, our own self-importance, that we are the centre of the universe and everything should revolve around us. And for, yeah, the idea of, I think that's one of the things why, one of the reasons why reverence can really challenge us actually, because it involves saying that somebody is more important than us, some, somebody else is higher than us. And that can feel really, really challenging, very, very uncomfortable. But um, yeah, ping, for Ping here, it's not an issue. The Buddha is definitely higher than him, and it's just this kind of very natural, spontaneous joy and reverence. Yeah, and I think the second, the second thing that I think this, this section tells, illustrates, is just the, yeah, the fact that people who, who have, or people who I regard as being further along the path than me, people who have practiced for longer than me and probably harder than me, they have, for me, uh, I experience a, a weight around them, presence around them. It's, they have a very um, positive effect on me. When there's, well, two people spring to mind. One is, you know, lots of people, but particularly Padma Vajra, who's our president, who he's, you know, he's been, well, he was ordained before I was born. Which, you know, was, I was born 38 years ago. I think he was ordained getting on for 40 years ago. And um, mm -hmm. he's just been consistently, steadily practicing for a long time. And with him, when he comes to Sheffield, it feels like the whole Sangha just is lifted you know, by his presence. It's just a more positive atmosphere. The Sangha seems to go deeper, more, become more positive. So it does feel like, well, my experience is people who have been practicing for a long time and, and much longer than I have, is that they have an effect on other people, people around them. So I can really see what um, Pingi is getting at when he describes the Buddha as being a world, a world of understanding, a universe of wisdom. It's almost like the Buddha creates this space, this world that... Um, Pingir has entered into. And it seems that this world isn't affected by space or by time because Pingir can be just constantly dwelling in this universe, this world that the Buddha has created and being affected by it, being influenced by it. So you know, if we can open ourselves up to something higher, then we can be influenced by that, we can be affected by that. If we, if we are closed off and cut ourselves off from what is higher than us, we're not going to be influenced by it, we're not going to be affected by it. So that's the kind of real crux of you know, the, the difficulty on, on the path, we need to be, you know, we need to be open, we need to be receptive. So this is bringing us back to the, um, these five aspects. We're going to look at receptivity in a few weeks' time, but this is a, an area where 
positive emotion and receptivity overlap because yeah we, we need reverence we need to be open to the influence of either those people or archetypal beings even that are higher than us that can influence us and affect us okay so then um yeah then something even weirder happens in the story a few weird things have happened but something weirder happens given what I've just been saying it's not so weird is the Buddha speaks to Pingya the Buddha actually starts speaking to Pingya and Pingya hears him and um, I'm not sure it's not clear whether Bhavari can hear and whether Bhavari is part of this conversation or whether it's just a conversation between the Buddha and Pingya but the Buddha speaks to Pingya and says Pingya other people have freed themselves through Shraddha you should let that strength release you you too will go to the further shore um, yeah, so the Buddha is saying to, to Pingya, basically the practice, your practice of recollecting the Buddha, your practice of Shraddha, can take you to enlightenment, it can, can free you, can, can, can release you. Um, it's quite a thing to say actually, the Buddha is saying just Shraddha, the, the, yeah, the, the strength of Pingya Shraddha will free him, will release him. He says other people have practiced in this way. And there are traditions which have kind of maybe developed from this, from this story, from this, from this encounter, but there are traditions which are very, very heavily based, based on Shraddha and based on faith in Buddhism. You know, we're not especially heavily based on that. But um, yeah, I think it's quite a thing to say that the Buddha speaking to Pingyi and saying, you can be freed, you can be released through Shraddha alone. Okay, I've now lost my page. I found it again. Okay. So yeah, so what the Buddha is saying is his, Pingya's practice of constantly revering the Buddha will lead him to enlightenment. And Pingya then, I don't know if he speaks aloud to Bhavri or if he just responds to the Buddha privately, but he says, these words are the words of wisdom. As I hear them, I become more confident, which is quite interesting. He's quite a confident man already. He's quite, you know, his confidence in the Buddha is pretty strong already. But hearing these words of the Buddha, he becomes even more confident. And he becomes so confident that he's convinced, he has no more doubts, he's convinced that he will gain enlightenment. So he says very, very emphatically, yes, I shall go there. I shall go beyond change. I shall go beyond formations. I shall go beyond comparison. There are no more doubts. You may consider this as mind released. Which again, I, I find very moving and just a very emphatic response. There are no more doubts. Yes, I'm going to get enlightened. You may even consider this as an enlightened mind. He's kind of so, he's just, you know, that kind of act of being so convinced has actually released him, it's actually freed him. So, yeah, it's quite, I mean, it's quite a thing to say about confidence in the teachings in Shraddha. It's almost like the more confidence we have in the teachings, the more wholehearted we'll be, the, the kind of, the bigger effect they'll have. And you can see this in meditation. If you sit down to meditate, kind of half-heartedly, thinking, well, it might work, but I'm not too sure. Nothing, it's not really going to work. It's not going to have that much effect. If you sit down really thinking, okay, this practice, I know it works, I know it's going to change me, I've seen it change other people, and really having trust in the practice, you'll do the practice with all of your heart, you'll do it with all of your, all of your being, and it will, really, it will really transform you. So I think that's partly how this dynamic can work. If you really have confidence and trust in the Dharma, then you still need to practice. It's not like you don't have to practice anymore, you still need, but your, the way you practice will be imbued with all your heart and all your being, you're really practicing. So, yeah, so that's the story of Pingya, the Pingya who is freed and released by his, his confidence, his Shraddha, and his encounter with his old teacher, Bhavari, and his just outpouring of positive emotion, reverence and devotion towards the Buddha. So what are the implications for us? Well, have, the implication for me is I need to stop talking quite soon. <laughs> Trying to trying to stop by twenty past, but it'll be a little bit over. Um, so yeah, so well, there's some obvious obvious implications for us. Firstly, you know, if Pingir can do this, well, so can we. You know, if Pingir can free himself through a practice of bringing the Buddha to mind and constantly bearing the Buddha in mind. Well, why can't we do that? Why can't we free us free ourselves in the same way? We've got exactly the same faculties of imagination, of awareness, of mindfulness. We can cultivate them just as Pingir did. So that has real implications for us, actually, that this can be, you know, root to awakening. And lots and lots of think repercussions, implications of 
you know, developed, unfolded from this over the, over the centuries. But you know, over time, this, is, this has been a really important practice and it continues to be an important practice for, for Buddhist practitioners to dwell upon the Buddha, to bring to mind the Buddha in imagination. And out of that has spurned and unfolded lots and lots of other images of enlightenment, which we'll meet in future weeks. And um, yeah, by dwelling on these, visualising, dwelling upon the Buddha and images of enlightenment, we are transformed by them, we are, we are influenced and transformed by them. So it's a very, very important practice, actually. And I think another implication for us is that Shraddha and reverence can be cultivated. It's something that can feel a bit alien to us in our culture, maybe difficult, but it can be cultivated. And I think, I think it's yeah, similar to gratitude. Gratitude involves recognising someone's benefited you and then having met, met her, I suppose. And in the same way, Shraddha involves recognising that somebody is higher than you and bringing meta to them. And they're both things we can cultivate. We can cultivate an awareness of people who are more developed than us and who are higher than us. And we can cultivate metta. And so one of the ways we do this is puja. And next week, luckily, I think it's next week, we've got a puja next Tuesday. So it'll be an opportunity to you know, just to experiment with reverence and devotion and, and work in this way. Okay, so... Um, Briefly, what, what, what about if we don't have a connection with the Buddha, or if we can't connect with the Buddha, what, what can we do? And I think this is where the Buddha's teaching on spiritual friendship is really, really important because, and the Buddha placed a real emphasis on friendship. And what, um, what could be said is that, you know, we might not be able to know much about the Buddha, we might not be able to bring the Buddha to mind, but we can, we can have friends who are practicing and we can see and we can tell, you, know, you can tell if someone is a bit further along the path than you are. And yeah, we can, we can, in the same way as the light was shining to, through the Buddha to Pingir, but it's almost like the light can shine a bit more dimly, the light of the Dharma, just through our friends to us. We can see the qualities of generosity, compassion, wisdom, just, just shining a little bit you know, more brightly than they are in us. And we get a sense of the direction, a sense of where those qualities might be, you know, what they might be like in their fullest. And there's a teacher, an important teacher called Gampopa, I didn't look up how long ago he lived, it was a long time ago. And um, basically he said that we're unlikely in, the early, in our early stages to recognise a Buddha. If we, if we met a Buddha, we just wouldn't recognise a Buddha, we just wouldn't know it was a Buddha, because isn't there an enlightened being. But what we can do, what's more important for us is a friend who is a bit more along the path, for just this reason, because we will just recognise and we'll be able to see the qualities of enlightenment just shining through them a bit more than they are in us. I just want to say a little bit about hierarchy because, um, yeah, this could be another thing that might jar with our culture, the idea of hierarchy, that someone might be better than me, someone might be further developed than me or have more about them than I do. Because we've got a real, uh, place of real importance on equality in our society. And there is, there is a place for equality, but there's also um, a place for hierarchy because we aren't all the same. In a sense, we aren't all equal. We are all equal in our potential. We've all got the same potential to grow. But everybody's at different stages of growth. Everybody's at different stages of development. So it'd be a bit silly to say that we are all equal because I'm certainly not equal to some of my friends. That I can, you know, my friends, some of my friends are a lot further down the path than I am. So yeah, that can be jarring for us. That um, the sense that there might be, be people higher than us or beyond us. But the truth is that hierarchy is really deeply embedded into, into Buddhism and the Buddhist tradition. And it's just quite natural. It's quite a natural part of reality. Some people are just more developed than other people. But it's not, it's not a kind of... Sangha Rechta, I've read Sangha Rechta speaking about this, and he was saying, well, it's not like it's a fixed place just to put you in your place, that they're better than you and you're there. It's a very dynamic process. We're growing all the time and we're encouraged to grow. So it's quite dynamic at one time. You know, some of my friends are more developed than me, and sometimes I'm a bit more inspired and you know, practicing a bit better than they are. It's very, very fluid and dynamic, so it's not like it's to put you in your place that this person's better than you. It's just more a natural state of affairs that we're just growing and unfolding, developing at different rates and in different ways at different times. So yeah, so through our friendships, we can, yeah, we can, we can experience reverence and um, we can experience shraddha. We can experience, yeah, when, when we... Um, 
our desire for their well-being meets encounters someone further along than us, we experience shraddha, we experience, can experience devotion, reverence. Okay. I think two more, two more points to make and then I'll, I will stop talking. And then the first point to make is that we've got this term for spiritual friendship called Kalyana Mitrata. That's the, the Buddhist term we translate as the spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitrata. And um, there is another way to translate it or interpret it, which is, which is equally important and sheds a, bit, you know, a different perspective on it. And that is to translate it as friendship with the lovely or friendship with the beautiful. So it's almost like you can have a beautiful friendship and you, you can be friends with what is beautiful. You can befriend what is lovely, what is beautiful in the world. So I think this, this opens up another way into reverence, which is um, similar to what I talked about with my experience in the Sagrada Familia Cathedral. It's almost like you can befriend that in your experience, which is beautiful, which is lovely. You can start to befriend that and you can have experiences of reverence in relation to beauty. So you can have that in places, you know, beautiful places like a beautiful cathedral. You can also experience reverence in that way in nature. So you, can, you may have had experiences of being out in in nature and just being surrounded by beauty and experiencing, in a sense, you, what you experience is yourself in your appropriate place. You're not, you know, you're not important, you're not the centre of the universe, you're kind of lifted out of yourself and you just, you, know, you just experience beauty. And um, so yeah, we can, it can, nature and beauty can be a place where we experience reverence. So I wanted just to make that point. Um, and then I want to just talk about what gets in the way of reverence for me. So I think for me, I can see the two characters in this story, Pingir and Bhava, as being like me at different times. Now, depending on what state of mind I'm in, I can find it quite easy to experience beauty and reverence and devotion, or I'm just not interested in it, basically, depending on what state of mind I'm in. So sometimes I'm in the state of mind like Bhavari, which is well, more cynical, more dismissive. Um, yeah, yeah. Bhavari kind of doubts the Buddha, he, he's, he's cynical, he, he's more dismissive. And I can often have a kind of yeah, cynical voice that just says, well, this is a load of nonsense, this is a load of rubbish. And I've started to recognise it more, it's the voice of my dad actually, it's what my dad used to say when I was younger, this is a load of nonsense, this is a load of rubbish. And I've just kind of imbibed that, this is a load of nonsense, this is a load of rubbish. So it's kind of a cynical voice that um, I can relate maybe to Bhavari, the character of Bhavari. And Pingir is, you know, the state of, when I'm in a state of mind full of metta and full of joy, maybe on a retreat or after a really good meditation, and the world just looks amazing, the world looks beautiful. And I was recently on a silent meditation retreat a couple of weeks ago, and often you'd come out of the shrine room and there'd be a load of Buddhists just standing looking at the sky and looking at trees. It's, you know, it's silence. So like what I was imagining they're thinking is just thinking, how beautiful, how beautiful the world is, how beautiful this tree is. You know, people just looking at blades of grass and kind of, little insects and usually that would just look like we just look like a bunch of mad people wouldn't we, to um, anyone in the street but you, you, you know you practice you're in silence you just get into these really uplifted states of consciousness more you could say more natural states of consciousness more as we ought to be as we could be and then the world just looks more beautiful the world looks yeah and there's just naturally more reverence more devotion to the world around you and i did i made some notes when i was in some of these states knowing i was giving this talk and I looked at them today and just thought, well, you know, what, what was I on about? I, mean, I, just I just seemed so kind of removed from how I was feeling today. I just couldn't kind of relate to that state that I was in when I was just you know, really looking at this amazing tree. And there's, there's one incident where I was um, just looking at a beam in a room, a beam of wood, a really old beam of wood in, the, in a room in the attic at Adistar. And I'm just thinking, this is really beautiful, a really beautiful piece of wood, just the kind of lines in the bit of wood and the cracks. And the more I looked at it, the more beautiful it became and the more I could see just felt really, really moved by this old bit of wood, basically. Um, which, yeah, t today when I was writing the talk, just felt quite alien, actually. I just thought, well, what, what was I doing then? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's almost like the cynical mind is, um, it's like looking, the beauty is there all the time, but it's like looking through a really dirty window and you just can't, you can, all you can see is the, the spots of dirt. And this was a feature on my retreat that was on the window, was really dirty. And I was looking out the window one day at this blue sky and just thinking, a lot of the time, all I can see is just the dirt on my own lenses, in a way, my own kind of perception of the world. Um, 
So yeah, when we're in those better states, it's like the, the window's been cleaned, the lenses have been cleaned, someone's cleaned our glasses, and we can just see the beauty that's there all along. So, yeah, Shraddha is said to be like a water purifying gem. You place it into a, a mind that's churned up with the hindrances, with anxiety, hatred, jealousy, desire. This is how your mind's churned up and you just can't see the beauty that's there. But Shraddha makes the mind clear and lucid. When we're really are confident and we're in that state where we know what we're about, what's important, what's valuable, it's like the mind becomes clear and lucid. So Shraddha is said to be like a, a water purifying gem that just clears the mind. So I'm going to end now with two poems, two shortish, one shorter, one a little bit longer. But basically, what I wanted to do was just to draw out that by ending, to say that basically enlightened beings and beings that are very, very far along the path, they have a real sense, they seem to have a real sense of kinship with the world around them, with nature and the world around them. It's not like, you know, in our society we see nature as just something to exploit, something to use, something to make money from. Actually, with you know, an enlightened being or someone much further down the path just has a sense of, they just spontaneously, naturally have a sense of kinship, of, of value, of sacredness about everything. And next week, we're going to be looking in the puja at two figures. One of them is going to be Amitabha. And um, we'll, we'll, you'll hear more about Amitabha next week, but just a little taster, which is Amitabha is the, the archetypal Buddha associated with Shraddha, with, with positive emotion, with, with metta, with kindness, with love, compassion. And his particular wisdom is the wisdom that sees everything as sacred. He sees a unique beauty in everything and in experience. He just sees everything as sacred and beautiful. Um, so it is the experience of those much further along the path to see things in that way, to see the world, to see life as sacred, to see other beings as sacred and revere them, to revere nature, revere life. So two poems, um, one by a, a Zen uh, hermit poet called Ryokan. And it's a poem about a flower, an orchid flower. Deep in the valley, a beauty hides. Serene, peerless, incomparably sweet. In the still shade of the bamboo thicket, it seems to sigh softly for a lover. I'm not going to read it again because there's not enough time. Um, but yeah, just for me, a real sense of just his. Oh yeah, I'm not going to explain it. It's just you can make of it what you will. And finally, a, a poem by our teacher Sangha Akshita, Bhante Sangha Akshita, um, where he, yeah, he talks. Well, you get a sense of how sacred he thinks nature is, and how sacred he thinks life is, and the world around us is. It's a poem called An Apology, which I'll just end with. We live in an age of apologies. Here is an apology that's much more meaningful than many being made today. Mankind owes a profound apology to the birds for having polluted the air through which they fly, to the ape and the tiger for having destroyed the forests in which they live, to the deer and the bison for ruthlessly hunting them almost to extinction to the rivers and streams for poisoning them with chemicals, to the earth itself for greedily pillaging its riches of silver and gold, to the ocean for slaughtering the greatest of her children, the whale, for scientific purposes, to the mountain peaks for defiling their virgin snows with our trash, to the moon for rudely invading her sacred space, to the stars for obscuring their brightness with the smoke of our cities. To the sun for not gratefully acknowledging our dependence on his bounty. To the truly great men and women of the past for not honouring their memory as we should and for not walking in their footsteps. <laughs>